After three months of voyaging upon the treacherous and uncharted seas, the Drag has finally reached her destination, Terra Australis, a new land surely laid by God to enrich the British Imperium. The Drake departed with a crew of 1,400. She now housed 1,333 souls, with the former 67 individuals laid to rest at sea. While all aboard felt comfort with the call of Land Ho after months of uncertain seas, they truly had no idea what this new land had in store. Land Ho! bellowed Murphy from the crow's nest. Very good, Mr. Murphy, very good. It seems my predictions were correct. Landfall at midnight. Hoist the sails and prepare the anchor, responded Captain Morgan. I can see a light from shore, Murphy shouted back at him. Yes, I suppose it'd be the reported savages with their bonfires. Mr. Keating, tell the boys to rest up. On the morn, we will breach this shore and claim this land for the crown of England. With that, the orders were announced, and the ship and crew made ready and rested. Three grueling months of sea travel had now come to an end, and all were eager to explore this new promised land. What riches await these new colonists? Mr. Keating, Mr. Grigger, and Mr. Rushton, how fare the rowboats? Are they ready for departure? questioned the captain. Aye, aye, sir, responded the men. Good work. Mr. Moon, Mr. Gator, and Mr. Phillips, you with me and the departure party. Mr. Davies and Mr. Crammond, I expect you to do your utmost to guide this rabble while I'm away. Is that clear? The captain announced sternly. Aye, sir, responded Crammond and Davies. Very well. Now, after long ado, let's touch earth again, shall we, chaps? The departure party started their row towards the island at around 7 a.m. By half past, they had reached the shore and felt land for the first time in months. While the crew were a professional lot, they all cheered in adulation and shared a laugh together for the stability of dry land. That laughter, however, was cut short by a strange sound emanating from the bush. What's that noise? A bellowing beast? At arms, men! What is that? muttered Mr. Moon. Aye, that be an ominous sound, pronounced Mr. Gator. Look, men, aim at the bushes, requested the captain. The four explorers held their weapons drawn towards the ruffling of the bushes ahead of them. Shortly after, images of masked primeval men creeped into view. These masked men wore no clothing and were armed with spear and oddly shaped sticks instead of musket and sword. One was even carrying something that resembled a cannon barrel. An intermission of stunned terror was shared between both parties, but before any violent actions were made, the masked men began to sing. They sang a low, dreary song. The wooden cannon was put to the lips of the man carrying it, and that noise of the bellowing beast returned. As the ancient men sang and played their instrument, the British were quite enthralled. I think these savages mean us no harm, men. Here, I offer you this, good sir. The captain held out his hand with salt pork as an offering, and after some reluctancy, the man with the biggest mast snatched the food from the captain's hand. He sniffed, looked behind himself at his brothers, and then began to chew. Ah, see, men, these savages value what we have, and as such, we have power over them. Need not fear, men, we are the rulers of this new land. Immediately after the captain's words finished leaving his mouth, there was a loud crack, <coughs> accompanied by a flash. <coughs> Oddly enough, the subordinates behind him made no noise at this transgression. He looked back and saw his three comrades locked into position, unmoving like statues. They were paralyzed. The captain beckoned to each underling, yet received the same response of naught but rapid eye movement that read of fear. He looked back towards the masked men, and only one stood in front of him. You and your people have insulted our land. We will not suffer the same fate you've dealt to our brothers and sisters. You will not sully this place. Your blood will feed it, chanted the masked man. <coughs> With another explosion and flash of smoke, the masked man disappeared. The bush disappeared, and the ground disappeared. Only blackness remained. 
The captain slowly regained consciousness. His eyes could barely open and his ears were ringing. He strained to separate his eyelids from the dry blood and as he did, he nearly leapt from his skin. He was meters above the ground, dangling. He was tied up in his compatriot's garments, bound and immobile like a spider's lunch. As he looked up to see what was attached, his eyes met the ship anchored in the bay. It was only a few hundred meters away and he could easily make out his crew. They were all looking in his direction, but still, Rumbling and the sounds of creaking, bending and snapping trees, cascading rocks, dust and earth. They came clearer and clearer. The ringing in his ears was replaced with a vibration, powerful enough to shake the leaves loose from the tree supporting him. And then he saw it. A gargantuan snake with reflective rainbow scales, unbelievably huge. It was clearing a path of destruction in its wake, moving earth as if it wanted to make a new river system. With utter dread, the captain realized it was heading straight to sea, straight to the boat. <laughs> 